So, today we're going to talk about the Amanita muscaria, also called fly agaric. And basically it's a poison mushroom, but it has quite a few medicinal properties, so it's worth knowing. Um, <clears throat> I think the toxicity is partially exaggerated, and on the other hand, you really should be careful with this mushroom. Um, the reason it's so good, easy to find. Um, it's a bright red mushroom with white spots on it, so it's really hard to mistake for a different mushroom. So you go out and you pick them. Usually you'll find them near birch trees. I've found them here in Germany around um, well, like pine trees in a kind of deciduous forest um, on the edge, and there's lots of them there. They really like being like among the trees. So you pick uh, quite a bit, and there's different things you can do with them. The first thing that you can do is to just chop them up fresh and put them in a bottle and put the bottle in a very cold, dark place. In Russia, they bury it in the ground, or they cover it in tin foil and put it in a, a spring, but it has to be very cold and dark, and you just uh, let it sit for a few weeks. Uh, it'll pretty much turn liquid. This already has quite a bit of liquid, and the liquid turns quite red. This is only about a week old. So that juice, you then, when it's finished, when it's pretty much liquid and red, you just pour it through a, uh, I pour it through a sieve first and then a coffee filter. And I would add some alcohol to the juice to make it keep, get it to about 25-30% alcohol. And really, you just use the juice. It's used externally. Very important. Don't drink it. Um, you just put two or three drops, or maybe a couple more, on sciatica pain in your back or any kind of pain you have. Though Russian women rub it on their hands for rheumatism, and it treats that quite nicely. So that's one way to use it. The next thing you can do is just dry it. Um, I've got some dried here. Um, I use a food dryer which is the easiest way to dry it. It's important when you dry it that it's really crispy. So here we have dried mushrooms. This is a very big cap and it contains a lot of water. So when you collect them, you'll find if you're going to make a recipe for a tincture or a salve with like 100 grams of dried powder, you're going to have to collect a lot of mushrooms to get 100 grams of dried powder. You just empty all these out here. So this is about, I'd say about 30, 30 caps, maybe more. But you'll see in a minute when we powder it, there's not going to be a whole lot left. So there's different opinions about this. Um, some use only the caps, some use the stems. Um, some sites will tell you that the red spots on the top are, are toxic, are the most toxic part of the plant. And since I find them kind of, I don't know, I'll say creepy, um, I do scrape them off with a knife. And then I clean the stems. I usually cut them open because sometimes you'll find slugs in there. So I just get the insects out and chop them up a little bit. So then you can kind of crumble them. They should be really crispy like this, because your worst enemy with any dried herbs is moisture, because moisture will cause fungus to grow, mold, and that will be the end of your herbs, because there's nothing you can do with moldy plants except really throw them away. So you always want to make sure, if you're not sure, or even if you've dried them and the dryer has gone out, and you come back like the next day and they've been sitting without heat for a day. I'd re-dry them a little bit because they will pull dried plants of any kind will pull moisture from the atmosphere just from the humidity in the room and they'll rehydrate themselves a little bit. So um, you always want to get them right out of the dryer and get them right into, right into a glass and process them, dry them chop them up and get them right into a glass. So you can, basically you can also save the pieces just like this if you want to, but usually 
well, uh, just for space reasons, it makes more sense since you're going to be using a powder later to um, to go ahead and grind them up. So you shall see, this is a pretty good amount right now. And we'll put them all in this bowl just so you can get an idea of what it looks like. So there's a pretty good amount right there. So they're nice and dry, they're crispy. So then I'm going to put them in my my killer Chinese herb mill, which is a very dangerous thing actually. Um, there's absolutely no safety things on this, but it'll turn any herb into a total powder in more or less seconds. It's really quite amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and fill that up. I'm going to get all of it in there. And so put the top on, tighten it up, get it good and tight. Certainly don't want that to be loose. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video while I do this because this is extremely loud, just so you get an idea. <laughs> Okay, so the grinder has done its work. We'll go ahead and open it. You want to maybe stay a little bit away from it because um, there is a certain toxicity to this plant, plus the chemicals can possibly be absorbed through the skin or by inhaling them. And um, the first thing that happens uh, if you take too much of this is that you're going to have kind of uh, trippy kind of feeling. Well, it's really intense smell. It's very sweet and um, If you take a little bit you'll feel like really energetic and clear in your head. It's quite amazing It's very it's a very good pain medication. It gives you some energy um, But if you take a little bit more you'll start Maybe having mild hallucinations not really hallucinations, but you have this thing where you where small objects appear larger and large objects appear, appear smaller and you might get dizzy and something like that. So when you're, if you're picking a lot of them or handling them, like when you're cleaning them and cutting them, um, if you're sensitive or if you're worried about it, you'd probably be best off wearing gloves. Okay, I've noticed that myself when I pick them in the forest, I don't wear gloves. And I start feeling really uh, kind of speedy. So um, that's usually for me the cue to stop. Then, then I just decide I've had enough. So there's quite a powerful energy to this mushroom and um, you really don't want to take any risks with it. So if you're you know, working with the powder, you might want to put on a mask or just be careful that you don't inhale too much and just when you get it on your hands, um, you'd probably be better off washing it off if you have a lot. So I'm just going to go get a little brush so we can empty this powder into the bowl. Okay, so now <clears throat> I've put it all in a bowl as you can see. It's a nice dried fine powder, and if you taste it, it's, it doesn't really taste bad. It's a little sweet. So there's a lot of different information about the toxicity of this stuff. Um, I think the best bet would be to start very carefully. Um, they say if you take the dried mushrooms and save them for a year, that it um, reduces the toxicity quite a bit. So that might be one thing to do just to keep it for a year. Some of the poisons degrade with time. Uh, another possibility is um, to reduce one of the toxic substances just to heat it up over, um, I'd say over 70 degrees uh, Celsius for a while because that'll turn the one uh, substance into another substance which um, most of these recommendations come from sites that are um, talking about using it to uh, fly or to have this kind of uh, trippy experience. So um, you'll find a lot of information actually about uh, this mushroom on sites that discuss drugs. But you know, I'd be really careful with that drug. Uh, like mushrooms can be really unpredictable. You can have one that, that's very mild and the next one will be really, really intense. So um, apparently the younger mushrooms are much more intense if you're tripping, if you want to trip, and the larger, older mushrooms 
are um, better if you're using them medicinally. I certainly wouldn't recommend using them to trip because, like I said, it's very unreliable and uh, kind of a risky thing to do. Um, for those who are interested in shamanic travels, I really don't think you need drugs to enter that world. Uh, so, but that's just my opinion. I mean, I know they're used a lot to get into a trance state, but it's possible to get there without using drugs. So that might just be the, the better bet, because we just don't, also don't have the traditional use of these things, so we're not really trained to deal with it. A lot of people go to the rainforest and take ayahuasca and uh, have some really bad experiences because they're just not ingrained in the culture that uses that, and they don't have the relationship to it that the native people do. So I would kind of stay away with it. I mean, the Vikings used to use them, they say, to, um, in battle, they would eat them, and that would turn them into raging maniacs that felt no pain. I mean, they definitely have this kind of um, effect that they give you energy. So I think used in, in mild doses, uh, they might be a really good kind of tonic. Um, they're very good for pain used uh, externally. And they're also good for all kinds of... Uh, of um, allergies, for nose itching, uh, they can be used in the ears for itchy ears or painful ears. Um, I can use them with dogs as well, very carefully. Um, they're quite effective in the treatment of these chronic ear infections. Um, you just have to dose them very carefully and I would, I would not use them with a cat and I would be I would probably not use them with a very, very small dog like a Chihuahua because it would be very difficult to dose them safely or it would have to be extremely diluted. Um, another good idea is to take milk thistle along with it if you're going to be taking, like, say, a tincture. Here I've made some tinctures out of the fresh mushrooms. You just chop them up into pieces and I put them in dark brown glasses. And, um, and there's different recommendations. I found an old pharmaceutical book in German that recommended um, the highest percentage alcohol that you can get. And uh, the traditional use in Russia is with vodka, but I think that may just be based on the fact that they have a lot of vodka there, um, rather than that it's better to use vodka. Um, some of the chemicals, or most of the chemicals, are water-soluble, so uh, in that respect it makes sense, but uh, when you dry the mushrooms you see what an enormous water content they have. So I think even if you're using 96% ethanol alcohol, um, you're still going to have a very high water content in the tincture because you just have to consider the water in the plant. The alcohol draws out the water. So um, yeah, I think if you're using vodka and it's about 40% alcohol, you may have a tincture that's not going to keep that long because it's certainly not going to be 40% alcohol when it's done after it's extracted the water. So um, that's something to think about. I've set mine up with 96% ethanol, organic ethanol, and I'm going to do another one with vodka just to see how they compare. And um, yeah, so with the tincture, they use it to treat things like cancer and I've heard some use for Lyme disease especially with the pain externally that certainly makes sense but apparently um, some people who have Lyme disease have um, had a lot more energy and felt a lot better using this. Uh, with cancer usually they recommend that you take one drop in a tablespoon of water and just increase the dosage by one drop every day until you reach 20 drops and then you dose it backwards from 20, 19, 18, 17 until you're back down to one and then you usually take a break of three weeks and then start it again. That said, if somebody starts feeling sick at around 10 or 12 drops, you would stop there and start dosing down from there and not continue to 20. And also with that, I would highly recommend taking milk thistle to protect the liver um, because these are definitely liver toxins as well. So I think an extended use would certainly be hard on the liver and um, apparently taking milk thistle will protect the liver but will not affect the or will not reduce the effectiveness of the treatment so just to be safe that's a good idea good okay so we have this nice yellow powder you can make a tincture with that or I usually use the powder to make a salve so 
usually use about 30 grams per 100 milliliters of oil. Um, you can use all kinds of oils, uh, coconut oil, you can use um, olive oil, which is what I usually use. And if you want it to really draw deeply into the skin, if you have some deep sitting, deep seated pain, you know, I always add a little bit castor oil, up to 30% castor oil, because castor oil will really um, go deep into the tissue. So um, that might be a good thing. And that you can also use on animals, but again, uh, I would use a weaker salve on an animal because what they do is lick it off. So they'll be ingesting it, so you have to consider that when you're uh, using salves on animals that you should um, make a very weak salve so that if they do lick it off that they don't have a toxic reaction. And of course start with very, very small animals and also with dogs. Um, I would give them milk thistle as well to make sure they don't have any kind of toxic effects with that. Okay, so that's about it. I think I've just about got it. Oh yeah, another important thing is to make labels. And I usually add a little, I don't know if you can see, a little cross bones and skull on it, just uh, and keep it obviously out of reach of children. I've heard stories about, um, I read a story in the internet about a cat where they had some fly agaric dried on the, uh, on a little altar and the cat apparently ate a piece. So that's something you want to avoid because, you know, that could be very, very, unpleasant or even deadly for the animal, so you certainly wouldn't want that to happen. So obviously keep it out of reach of children, especially teenagers, if they, you know, if they hear about it, that you can actually get high from it or something. Um, they might try it and, uh, you know, you can poison yourself with this mushroom, no doubt about it, and people have died eating them, um, so that's something to be careful with. Another thing to mention is that apparently you can eat them. Uh, since the toxic chemicals in the mushroom can be extracted into water, what they do is they um, boil them in a lot of water. So you, you want a big amount of water so the mushrooms really move around. And you boil them really hot at a, at a high temperature so that the water is really bubbling for at least 15 minutes. Then you throw away the water, pat them dry to get the excess water off the mushrooms. And you can also boil them again. So you can put them in a pot with fresh water, uh, boil them again for maybe five or 10 minutes, and then put that water away. And then you put them in a frying pan and without any oil, just fry them a little bit to get the excess moisture. Because remember the toxins are in the water. So you want to get that excess water off out of the mushrooms. And once they've kind of dried a little bit, um, you can add some butter and seasonings and eat them. And apparently they're quite tasty. I don't particularly like mushrooms, so I haven't tried that yet, but um, I'm sure I will at some point if I can find anybody that will dare to eat it because I really am not a big mushroom eater. Okay, that's it. Have fun.